Greetings everyone and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you're sitting in the back row or if you are new and enjoy what you're hearing, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button and set your notification bell to all so you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video. Also, if you enjoy what you are hearing, you can buy me a coffee or if you're interested in becoming a member of the channel, all that information can be found down below in the description box. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Stalker Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. After that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. I worked in a mental hospital. A violent patient developed an obsession with me. He eventually ended up in a hospital for the criminally insane. Some time later, he managed to convince the board that he was no longer a threat and was released. Within 72 hours of his release, he had managed to locate my home address and my phone number. Hey, I said he was insane, not stupid. I began seeing him everywhere I went and getting hang-ups and heavy breathing calls. I started seeing him around my condo complex, but could never get the police there fast enough to catch him. I quit my job and moved out of state, leaving everything I owned that didn't fit in my car. It was a good two to three years before I could finally stop looking over my shoulder. Before I get into the story, there's a few things you need to know. First, I am an artist and have always been very in my own world, as it were, if I was thinking of a story or character or a picture I wanted to draw. I'd walk into walls and forget anything anywhere and place items in weird places while I was thinking. To give you an idea the extent of this, my first place to look for anything I've lost is the refrigerator and freezer. I found remotes, my cell phone, art equipment, anything really I found in there. Second, I have always had a very negative view when it comes to alcohol or any other narcotics. I don't mean to shame anyone if you were listening to this, but it was always something I just generally regarded as pointless. However, if you find enjoyment in it, all the better to you. Third, I am a very asexual person. I never desire sex or have any interest in finding a mate, so flirting usually flies over my head. And finally, due to my childhood, I have a mild case of anxiety disorder, which has lately been worse due to this event and escalated by other ones. This particular story begins when I graduate from an upper secondary school for visual arts. Upper secondary is the type of high school in Scandinavia. I had decent enough grades, my best being biology and English, and of course, art. I immediately looked for work after graduation, since I had graduated half a year late because of some health issues, and the entrance exams for universities were already done by the time I graduated, so I had around one and a half years before even the possibility to apply for a university comes around. I would send hundreds of applications to any place that would take me and hardly ever got even invited for an interview. This took its toll on me and I got depressed. I'd hardly leave the house and I stopped taking care of myself altogether. I wouldn't shower, put on makeup, brush my teeth, any of the things. I'd avoid mirrors and I felt as though I was a complete and utter failure which was not made any better by my parents who pressured me with, how many applications did you send today? Or, you really need to get this job so you can start saving to move out. This might sound mean, but 
They didn't mean it in a bad way, since I'd expressed the need to get my own flat for the past few years. Not to mention, my relationship with my parents at the time was very strained, since my depression made me very irritable and angry. So I can't really blame them for pushing me to get out of the house. This continued for around a half a year, until I finally got a job in a hypermarket around 8 miles away from the place that I lived. Life really picked up from there, and I started to take better care of myself once again. The people I worked with were all very nice, and I had no issues with anyone. Though they were very normal, so I'd get invited to get-togethers or to have a pint after work, etc. I always made an excuse why I couldn't go and would play MMOS or something instead at home. This might sound sad, but I just enjoyed myself more like that. Fast forward a year of working, and I was accepted into my number one choice university. And due to this, I cut my hours in half at work, so I was only at work for two to three nights a week. The particular hypermarket chain I worked at had a yearly festival week gimmick to boost sales or whatever. And this year, we were handed scratch cards to sell during the cashing out process. Apparently, the chain had a contest within every location, and the winning hypermarket would be given a $1,000 in cash prize for employee refreshments, meaning booze. Our hypermarket decided we'd take everyone out for a night of drinking at a resort or hotel area connected to the shopping mall or workplace was with the money. No surprise there. And since I had grown close friends with many of the other cashiers, I was invited to win, even if I usually didn't enjoy going out. Everyone in the department was so excited for it. It was kind of infectious. Long story short, we won the competition and we went drinking. Our boss was so pleased with how well we did and how motivated we were, he even opened us a tab in the first bar we went to. So I had quite a bit to drink too. When the first bar closed down, we went, on our own money, to continue in a nearby nightclub. I hardly remember anything else than that. I drank like a sailor and sang karaoke horribly. We stayed until closing time and I made my way to the train station to catch the last train home. On my way, I was stopped by a man with a thick accent who asked if he could walk me home. I laughed and just said that no worries, I was literally a few steps away and motioned towards the station. He then apologized and said he thought I lived in the student buildings nearby and went on his way. I thought that was quite an endearing way to ask someone out and thought nothing more of it. Anyway, another year passes by and I'm now living alone in a student block, not far away from my parents' home. The area I moved to was very poor since it consisted only of students. So in a weird way, I actually felt safe living there. The walls were as thin as paper so everyone would hear if anything happened to me or if anyone tried to break into my home, etc. Granted, I got an email from the company that funded the cheap student blocks that the bike seller in your address was broken into, but I never kept anything in there, so it didn't really faze me. Sometimes I'd even forget my keys on the lock in the front door and wake up in the morning to a neighbor ringing my doorbell and handing me the keys with a joking, nothing to steal, uh huh? There also was a very convenient bus that stopped right outside my door that I could take for both school and work, though I needed another bus to get all the way to work. One Saturday, after a nine hour shift at work, looking and feeling like a total zombie, I was making my way to the bus stop through an underpass late at night when I heard someone call out to me through my earphones. I always stopped if I heard someone call out when I was near work since it usually was a colleague offering a lift or a regular customer wanting to crack a joke or 
one of the guys from a GameStop upstairs, wanting to talk about Skyrim or something like that, blah, blah, blah. I was basically friends with nearly every employee in the mall, so someone stopping me late at night in a sketchy parking lot or underpass was very common. I didn't recognize the man, but then again, I handled around 600 customers every day, so I hardly ever did. I also was conditioned to flash a bright smile through years of customer service whenever I met anyone's eyes, even outside of work. I'm sure the ones who've worked in customer service jobs for a long time can relate to this. The man spoke hurriedly in a thick accent about how he was in love with me and how he had been watching me. It was very hard to make sense of anything he was saying. It was a stream of consciousness kind of thing how he spoke. What I did make out was that he had seen me in a bar, which he named, and ever since he had been watching me and never before found the courage to talk to me before now. I was completely unsettled by the choice of words, but I checked it to him not being a native speaker. I listened to him while I nervously eyed the underpass, feeling glad there were a few people walking through it during this whole spiel. After he quieted down, I just awkwardly said, Okay, thanks, but I need to go or I'll miss my bus, and turned to continue on, when he grabbed me and pushed me back toward the walls of the underpass. I was around 30 centimeters taller than him, but he had a lot of mass over me. Since the most sport I had ever done was acrobatics and ballet, and I'd quit even that years ago. I considered punching him or screaming, but I felt it better not to escalate the situation. So I sternly told him to let me go and that I needed to get to the station. He pleaded for me to give him a chance and said he wouldn't let me go before I did. I was racking my brain about the safest way out of this situation, so I tentatively told him, What if I save your number and I'll see if I call you? I had used this on another persistent suitor before and it had worked just fine. Now I wished I'd never uttered those words. The man's face lit up and he started to spell out his name, as he was somewhere from, I'm guessing, the Middle East. While I pulled out my phone and hammered his name and number into my phone, sighing in relief, I was almost safely back at my home. And suddenly, he grabbed my hand and tore my phone from my hands. At this point, I angrily screamed, What the fuck are you doing? Give it back! But to my horror, everyone had moved on from the underpass, and I was alone with this creep and he ignored me, struggling and screaming completely, and calmly just called his own phone number from it, before handing it back to me, as if what he just did was completely normal. I stared at him, terrified and dumbfounded. He then hugged me tight, cupping a feel, and tried to kiss me. I hurriedly blocked his mouth with my hands and forcibly pushed him away. I didn't say anything anymore and just ran out, from the underpass, and he didn't even try to stop me. When I was safely at home, I blocked his number first and then deleted it, thanking any deity possible that when I moved out and got my new phone, my father had insisted on an unlisted one, so he couldn't just find my address out on Google. I asked my manager to not give me the Saturday night shift for a while and explain my problem to her. I also asked if he could be banned from the store or something, but she told me she couldn't do anything before I filed a restraining order. Obviously, I had no idea what the man's name or number was anymore, not to mention getting a restraining order on him based on what I had as evidence was very unlikely. A few weeks went by and he showed up when I was at work without fail, as if he knew my ship even though I had a different shift every week. He'd just stare at me from outside the shop or buy a single lollipop or something else cheap multiple times a day, paying with cash, so I had to extend my hand to him 
which he always took and held for as long as there was no other customer there. The horrible thing about this was, it was not unusual to get a creeper customer every so often. Every now and then, you'd get them if you worked as a cashier. Mentally ill or just socially inept, desperate people mistake customer service as genuine interest painfully often, and you hardly paid any more attention to it than the other customers. Since nearly always it's a short-term thing and kind of harmless. Basically, this man could have been stalking me for God knows how long, and I just hadn't noticed. The thought that I only noticed this now that I had that earlier encounter with him was enough for me to lose sleep over and get a reoccurring sleep paralysis nightmare of someone entering my room and breathing heavily in my ear as a result. This went on and it was now a few days until my four weeks of paid and four weeks of unpaid summer vacation I had registered and given. The thought of not having to go to work and face this man every day was enough to perk me up. So I threw myself into an extracurricular school project, a game for a museum's exhibit. One day, I had stayed at school working on a 2D rig for said project until school was closing and the janitor ushered me out of the classroom. I had a little while before my bus was due to arrive at the stop, so I decided to catch some fresh air after working nearly 12 hours on the computer and walked to the nearby station that was at the end of the line. The bus was already waiting, so I rushed in, and after I paid the fee and faced the back of the bus, my stomach turned. There he was, with three friends, the guy with the thick accent, my stalker. We were the only passengers. I thought about getting off the bus, but the next one wouldn't be for an hour or so. Against all common sense, I decided to stay on. I sat on the very front of the car, hoping he wouldn't notice me. But as soon as the bus left the station, he moved to sit next to me, and his friends moved to sit behind me, as if he knew this was the line I took usually, and just waited so I couldn't exit the bus. I was ready to throw up. I turned my music so loud in my ears that it hurt. I ignored every tap and shoulder grab. I clenched my laptop back on my lap, ready to sacrifice my computer and smack him in the face with it if he tried to do anything else. Then the realization hit me. This line stopped literally on the front door of my building. My name was plastered on the front door of the building. He would know where I lived. I felt as if I could just burst into a howling cry any moment now. My thoughts were going a mile a minute, considering everything that could happen to me if I didn't have a way to get out of this situation. I knew there was a longer stop coming up later, so I decided to try to make my break then. When the stop rolled around, heart pounding, I said, music still breaking my eardrums. Sorry, I need to get off here. And made my way to the mid doors, all four men following me, speaking fast in Hebrew. When the doors opened, I stepped out and walked a while before suddenly turning back and running like I was possessed back into the bus and yelling at the driver. Drive, just please go, go, go. The driver looked taken aback looked at the men who were running towards the bus and back at my face, twisted into loud sobs as I was shaking, and he decided I was serious, closed the doors, and he sped off. He stopped the bus at a garage a few miles away, asking if there was anything he could do, call the cops or something. I just kept sobbing and recanted my first encounter to him when something in my head clicked. The bar. He had specifically named it. It was the nightclub we went to continue our drinking over a year ago when we won the contest. I never before or after had visited that nightclub. He said he saw me there. He had been tailing me over a year. That night, he was the one who offered to walk me home. 
That's why he showed up at my work without fail whenever I was working. I sobbed, howled like a damn tortured cat at that, and the driver told me to go lie down in the back and that he'd drive me home, and I told him it was the last stop. The driver dropped me off safely at home before he continued his round, risking his job for my safety. I can't thank him enough, and I don't even know what his name is. After this second incident, I called in to work sick until my vacation and cut off my hair and dyed it black. I also only spent the vacation biking around my hometown during the day, staying out from the town my work and school was for the whole two months. I occasionally still sometimes have these sleep paralysis nightmares, but I never saw him again. A small part of me thinks it's because he doesn't want me to. One thing is for sure though, I never left my keys in my lock again. So, to the man with the thick accent, I hope we never meet ever again. I have pushed this from my mind in the past couple of months because any activity has seemingly stopped, yet somehow I knew this silence was too good to be true, and eventually we will hear from him again sooner or later. It all started a few months ago. A guy messaged me on Facebook, and unlike the usual creepy messages I get, this one sounded intelligent and funny. We started chatting from time to time, talking about anything and everything. He said he was divorced with one child, and I empathized every time he would explain about his ex-wife, even though it also kind of bothered me that he would tell all those personal details to a virtual stranger. After all, no matter what happened between them, she was still the mother of his child. Have some respect. We continue chatting, and I'm getting more relaxed. We are at that stage when we often discuss our daily lives, and inevitably, I talk about my best friend, with whom I am extremely close. We are more like sisters. At that particular time, she had been very busy with changes happening at her work and some issues with a guy she met but said things are complicated and she will explain the details when there is more time to meet. Now, keep in mind, under normal circumstances, I would have known every little detail about that, but as it happened then, there wasn't sufficient time to properly see each other and talk. So I only knew the basics, no names, no pictures, etc. So I am talking to my guy for the sake of privacy we will call him Jake, and I started taking notice that every time we do, he would casually direct the conversation towards my best friend, Jenna. I have mentioned to him that we have known each other since we were babies, practically grew up together, so he would always ask me to tell him funny stories from our childhood and teen years, then proceed inquiring about what she is like now, what kind of guys she likes, etc., I would jokingly ask if he got tired of me and wanted her number, but he would deflect it with awkward humor, so I didn't really think anything past that. Some time had passed and things are a bit calmer at Jenna's work, so we finally get to meet for drinks. Inevitably, we start discussing Jake. I tell her about him and she is smiling and nodding until I take my phone out and show her his pictures and she goes pale in the face. She grabs my phone and says, This is him. This is the guy I told you about. At first, I assume she is joking and she is prone to messing with me. But she looks dead serious. So I start asking questions. Turns out, she met him on a dating app. They talked first and she was under the same impression that he was smart, charming, and cultured. So when he eventually asked her out, she gladly accepted. They went out, had drinks, talked, and everything was fine. Until by the end of the evening, he got a little too grabby and insisted 
for more than a good night kiss. He insisted to drive her home, even though she had her own car there, and suggested that he could pick her up in the morning to go get her car. Since she didn't want him to know where she lives and she was annoyed at his advances, she refused and managed to escape him somehow. She told me that she was afraid he would follow her home, so instead she went to a bar where a friend of hers worked at. The next day, he called her and apologized for his behavior at the end of the evening, blamed the drinks and the stress at his work, and then told her he had to admit something to her because he really liked her and wanted to be honest with her. She agreed and they met again. When he admitted that he was actually in the process of getting a divorce but hasn't yet filed for it and he was still living with his wife and small child because she didn't have a job and he couldn't just have her alone tending for their child before she was financially stable. Jenna, being the blunt gal she is, called bullshit at his story and accused him of being another married man out to cheat and use false excuses for sympathy. The guy worked as a sales rep, so he was really smooth and convincing. So I don't know how, but he managed to appease her doubts, at least to a point of not cutting him right off, then and there. Some time passes and he chats to her online, calls her, and they talk but she tells him that the only way she would ever consider getting intimate with him would be if she sees proof that he is actually divorced and lives separately from his family. One day, he calls her and tells her that he will put his wife on the phone to prove to her that even though they live together, they sleep in separate rooms and are technically separated. A woman's voice really confirms that but it leaves Jenna more puzzled than reassured. She is conflicted because, despite everything, she actually likes the guy and is therefore worried to not get herself into a mess if she falls deeper. She is still hesitant to accept his invitations to meet, so one day he accidentally walks past the place she works at, exactly the time she finishes work. What are the chances, right? And she agrees to go grab a drink as long as they talk and act platonic, he promises. And apparently that is also when she tells him about her life more, childhood, etc. And where I am brought up into this conversation. He listens attentively and afterwards when she and I compared timelines. It turns out exactly a few days after that that my guy starts to message me on Facebook. We are both livid and incredulous, so we decide to confront him separately and then compare notes. When I got back home, I text him seeking why he lied to me that he was divorced when he clearly is still living with his family and more importantly, why he started talking to me when he was already seeing my best friend. He was unprepared for that, but he bounced back quickly and gave me some bullshit explanation about how he was curious about me when he heard so much from Jenna and wanted to see what I looked like. So he went through her Facebook friends list and found me. Mind you, she hasn't added him on Facebook, so he basically stalked her profile to gather that information, just like she didn't exactly tell him where she worked yet he knew to accidentally walk past there. When Jenna confronted him, he told her that he was just curious and wanted to hear about her from the person that knows her best, her best friend. She told him that it was wrong and creepy on so many levels, but he insisted he had no bad intentions and that he just liked her so much that his curiosity got the better of him, etc., uh, what the fuck? When we compare notes after that, Jenna and I decide to just stop talking to him whatsoever. Because the guy is a liar and extremely weird. We tell him, and we don't want to talk to him or see him again. And even though he is shocked and tries to convince us otherwise, he eventually accepts that and says that if we change our mind, he will be happy to talk. 
we think that it's over. Oh, the naivete. At first, he seemed to take it well, but then he would accidentally send a picture or a message was intended for someone else, but mistakenly sent it to me or Jenna, just so he could initiate a conversation. He would attempt to ask her or me out again, get confused, and then retreat again until the next accidental message or call. Then the random bumping into each other ensued. Wherever we would go, on our way to work, at the market, at a cafe, at Jenna's gym, he would be there. Of course, it was all random coincidence. We started to get annoyed more than anything at this point, and still thought he was a lying bastard, but still harmless, so there's not much we could do except wait it out thinking he would eventually move on. Well, we were wrong. One day, Jenna comes to my place, freaked out, and she tells me that she was on a date with a new guy she met, and she saw Jake passing by the restaurant she was in, and then later he called her in hysterics, screaming at her. Look what you did. I can't get you out of my mind because of you. I get so angry that I hit my child and chased my wife out of the house in the cold. She got fed up with him, so she told him to never bother her again and go seek a therapist because he clearly has issues. Then she blocked him. That creeped us both out because not only wasn't he moving on, he seemed to have been escalating and getting aggressive. I told her that if he calls her again, she should threaten him with calling the police and reporting that he was allegedly abusive towards his family. We are in the middle of discussing that when I get a call from an unknown number, and normally I don't pick up those, but I was also waiting for a package to be delivered and thought it might be from the courier company. It was him. He was crying. He was sobbing on the phone, pleading with me to convince Jenna to unblock him, that it wasn't fair, and I just had to help him. He sounded like crazy to be honest. I was shocked to hear him in this state. It was such a contrast to his normally smooth demeanor. So I calmly told him that he should act like a grown man and just calm the hell down and that it is not my place to convince her about anything after she made up her mind, especially after his crazy behavior and threats about hitting his child and chasing his wife out into the cold. He then told me that he didn't really do that, but he wanted to make Jenna feel guilty and scare her into talking to him. So he said that. He started apologizing profusely about it and said he was at his wit's end and didn't know what to do. I told him that this has gone on far enough and that he is a 35-year-old male, so he should act like it and that if he ever proceeds contacting or stalking us, we will go to the police. I hung up and blocked him as well. The police threat seemed to work finally. We haven't heard from him for about two months, but yesterday, Jenna and I were at a birthday party at a club, and guess who was the birthday girls plus one? Last year, I went out of state for my first year of college to a school in Indiana. In the first week, I formed many friendships, and one of those was a boy who would end up becoming my stalker. He was fairly normal at the start, and I genuinely enjoyed his company, as well as his roommates, and we became quite close, spending a lot of time together. Soon, I had developed friendships with other people, and he became a part of my friend group. About a month into knowing him, I started to get a feeling that he liked me more than a friend. I still acted normal around him because I didn't want to draw attention to it, because the feeling wasn't mutual, and I didn't want to ruin our friendship. One night, about three months into school, everything changed. This night, all of my friends came to my dorm room. At the time, it was a double I was occupying by myself. 
to drink before they went to a party. I had told my friends that they could drink in my room, but I did not want to go out because I was very upset by a hurricane that was hitting my town in Florida. All of my friends were supportive of this, except my soon-to-be stalker. Throughout the time he was in my room, he was making jokes about how dramatic I was being and even when everyone else told him to stop, he wouldn't let up. Finally, everyone is ready to leave to go to the party. My stalker is the last to exit my room. Before going, he tells me that he cares about me and that if I change my mind and decide to go out or if I need anything, that I should text him, which I found strange given his previous behavior. But I figured he had come to his senses and was attempting to be a good friend. A couple of hours after my friends leave, I get a text from another friend telling me to come help our one friend who was too drunk and is vomiting. So I change and walk to her building. Upon arriving, I find out she is fine now and that they put her into her bed. I go outside of their building and cry about what's happening at home on the steps by myself. I get a text from my stalker asking if I had changed my mind. In the moment, I was sad and figured if I went out with them and drank, maybe I would feel better. I tell him where I'm at and ask if the group wants to meet up. He says that they will come, but arrives alone. He suggested we hang out in my room, but I told him I want to go see the group. He didn't seem too happy with this, but I call one of my other friends to see where they are, and we go to another dorm building where they are drinking. The party was busted, so we left. When we get inside, we had a hard time figuring out which floor they are on and what room they are in. My stalker is visibly drunk at this point and pushes me into one of the connecting suites that is vacant. He begins to make fun of me again for being upset and is becoming very touchy. I push him off me and tell him to stop. We finally find one of our friends and that friend tells us we can meet him in his room and he has alcohol there. My stalker suggests we just go to his room instead because he's in a fight with one of the other guys and doesn't want to see him. So I believe this and agree. When we get to his room, we are greeted by his roommate and a bunch of his roommate's friends. My stalker grabs a backpack with his alcohol and says we should just go to my room and our friend group can meet up with us. So we do. My dorm had two beds in it and my stalker sits on the one I sleep on. So I decide to sit on the other one. He puts on a movie and everything is normal at first. I immediately begin texting one friend whose room everyone was in and tell him to bring our friends over to my room. My friends were all drunk at this point and everyone I texted wasn't making sense. My stalker then gets into the same bed as me and lays beside me. I immediately feel uncomfortable and start rapidly texting my friends and tell them that Blank is acting strange and that they need to come now. He sees I'm on my phone a lot, and so my stalker grabs my phone from me and tells me, need to take a 10-minute break from it. During this time, he becomes very touchy and suggests we try this trick with my jewel where he exhales it into my mouth, to which I reject. I tell him it has been 10 minutes and that he needs to give me my phone back but he denies knowing what I am talking about. I stand up and move to the other bed because I feel uncomfortable. He gets up and moves as well. I sit to the very end of the bed opposite of him and demand my phone. He continues to play dumb tricks. Instead, he moves closer to me and tries to playfully touch me. I have had enough at this point and tell him he needs to give me my phone right now and that it isn't funny anymore. He tells me he needs to go to the bathroom. While he's in the bathroom, I grab my laptop and I message all of my friends to come to my room, ASAP, and tell them he is being very creepy and I need their help. Once he returns, he tells me right away that he wants to level 
with me and that he thinks we should hook up. I had been making it very clear the entire time that I did not want that and thought he would be able to read my body language and the situation and realize I was clearly uncomfortable. I tell him no and that I just want to be his friend and not ruin the friendship. He doesn't listen. He comes over to me and starts playfully grabbing me when I'm pushing him off and tell him to stop. He pushes me down onto the bed and tries to come over me. He grabs my legs, pulls me into him. I was thankfully sober and was able to kick him away from me and get up and run into the hallway. He doesn't leave my room and begins to insult me and tell me he never wanted to be my friend and only wanted to sleep with me and that guys and girls could never be friends. It always has to lead to something more. He then says he would never date me and that I'm too emotionally unstable for him and a slew of other insults. One thing he said that especially scares me is that he was raised to take what he wants no matter what when defending his actions. I don't know what to do and just start crying and yelling at him to leave my room. He refuses and then makes fun of me crying. At this point, he still has my phone and won't give it back or leave. I threaten to call the campus police on him if he does not leave and finally he agrees. After that night, he texted me every day for a week trying to talk to me and one of my friends told me to listen to what he had to say, so I do. He ended up confessing his love for me and told me that he still thinks we cannot just be friends, even after I said multiple times that that is all we would ever be, and ultimately I told him I think we need to just stop talking. All the other friends knew what happened and dropped him as well. He spent months trying to talk to me. He became completely obsessed. I would still hang out with his roommates, but I would only go to their room when he wasn't there. On the few occasions when he would come in, he would later text me paragraphs about how immature I was being for ignoring him. Finally, I said, we could try to be civil and just be acquaintances to be nice, but that led to him getting very mad at me for still acting uncomfortable around him and never wanting to hang out with him. At this point, every time I would see him, he would blow up my phone and text me nonstop about me being fake towards him and that I needed to get over myself. I said fuck it and finally blocked him. After doing this, he gets very angry. He would show up where I was all the time and just stare at me. His roommates would tell me that he talked about me every night, basically for the rest of the school year. He would try to ask them things about what I was doing and who I was with, hooking up with, etc. He would go up to my close girlfriends all the time and ask what he could do to fix things with me. He tried to fight a guy who expressed he was interested in taking me out on a date. A few months after the event, he made up excuses to come to my door. He lived on the same floor as me almost every single day. He tried to talk to me in the hallways. He would offer me his things and even bought me a Christmas present. The last few months of school, he told his roommate that his goal was to sleep with me before graduation and that he thinks I want him and am just playing games with him. I in no way want him or make it seem this way. The only way I act towards him is completely disgusted. Even over the summer, he had been texting his roommates about me. All of my friends tell me he's stalking me and recognizes that the way I am acting is in no way asking for his attention. I go back to school in the middle of August, and unfortunately he will be there. He will be living in a frat next year, so I don't have to worry about him being on my floor, but he still worries me. I think something is very wrong with him, emotionally or mentally and not just because of the way he's acted towards me. 
I think it's just in general. I don't want anything to happen to myself or anyone else and think I should do something about it. Looking back on that night, I would say his behavior and the things he said were very rare. And the people who think, if I want something, I should take it no matter what, are at a higher risk of being wrecked by that person. I'm a 24-year-old female that moved from Orlando, Florida to 18 miles outside of Valdosta, Georgia, middle of nowhere, basically, to my family farm. Never had any issues in Orlando, but I got divorced and had to move in with my mom. It was my small boys and I. Anyways, we moved into one of the old farmhouses on my family's farm, and it needed a lot of work. It was eight bedrooms and a mother-in-law suite. When we moved in, we only had two rooms cleaned up and worked on the rest of the house over the course of nine months. The man across the street, we will call him Jay, was very helpful. From day one, he would come almost every day as he was feeding up his animals and help with anything I needed. Over the course of nine months, I never had any issues and thought he was just a friendly middle-aged man. I never felt he had any ill intentions. The farmhouse was in a U-shape. The room I chose had windows in the courtyard area. This was the middle of the house. Jay has fenced in that area when I first moved in so I could let the boys play. The farmhouse was in the middle of the farm and set off the road, so I never had any worries of being watched mostly as my bedroom windows are in a fenced area in the middle of the house, so I didn't put curtains on my bedroom or bathroom. One day, my son was playing under the carport and Jay pulled up in his truck. He was going to look at my car for me. Jay didn't make it to the carport before my eldest son's estimate. Hey, I seen him in my window last night. Later that night, I talked to my son and he told me he did see him out a window. I asked him if it was the kitchen window because you can see his horse pasture and he stops to feed them every morning and night. Chalking it up to that, I didn't think much else about it, but other things had happened. I guess you could say I wanted him to be the person I thought he was, so I overlooked a lot. My favorite candy somehow appeared in my fridge one day after school. My mom told me she remembered me telling Jay it was my favorite. Someone sent me flowers every Friday for a couple of months. I thought it was my ex-husband or possibly my boyfriend at the time. Neither man would admit it. My boyfriend jokingly said it was Jay. The next day, I came home from school and my mom had the boys playing under the carport and Jay was working on my car. My air suspension had a leak and Jay offered to look at it before I took it all the way to Tallahassee for the expensive repair. I got out of my mom's car and he asked me if I wanted to see the leak he had found. As I bent over the hood, Jay stepped back. When I turned around, I commented, jokingly, on his 90s era cell phone. He had it in his hand, that's the type you don't see anymore, like a very early flip phone. Later that night, he came inside and my mom told me she could swear that Jay had taken a picture of me on his phone. I know it sounds crazy, but I didn't believe her. The man was seriously always friendly, never any weird vibes from him. If I offered to pay him, it was always at cost and that was rare as he would not accept my money. I should have known that people just aren't like that these days. I guess I was very naive. A couple weeks later, I was mowing my courtyard. It was grown up pretty bad, and as I got close to my windows, my heart literally sank into my butt. I had a newly placed center block outside, both windows and my bathroom window. I can't tell you how. But I knew at that point that I had made a huge mistake and everyone was right about Jay. 
I called my friend and named her Josh to come look at the center blocks. He ran home and got a deer cam, attaching it to a tree outside my window. This was at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. That night, I came home at around 6 and was unloading the boys when I turned around. Jay was standing behind me. He said, Hey, didn't mean to scare you. I heard your mama was out of town. I said, Yes, sir. I knew he knew because they are friends on Facebook. He told me to call him if I get scared or needed anything. I got the boys inside and we got snuggled into bed. They fell asleep in my bed when I realized that I had missed Sunday's episode of Game of Thrones. It was a good one. The dragon died. So I went to my mom's bed to watch. I was laying there talking to my ex-husband about the boys and the show when Josh called. I clicked over, and he asked if my boyfriend was over. I told him no, that it's 9.02 p.m. He told me a man is outside my window. The deer cam snapped the first picture at 9.02 p.m. My boys are in my room sleeping. Josh told me not to worry. He was already coming up the driveway and to meet him outside. Other side of the house, that is. Fear and dread literally drained through me. I slowly walked into my room and calmly scooped up my boys. I shut that door and sprinted through the house as fast as I could. We sat in Josh's truck until the police arrived. The deer cam snapped photos at 902, 922, and 930. He stood outside my window that long, waiting for me to come back. The police walked back into the field and could see where he was parking but he was already gone. Behind the house is a massive produce field, and it was a tractor road for tractors access. I show them the photos and ID, Ed J. He was arrested at two that morning, and when they went through his phone, nine months worth of pictures. Pictures of me mowing, pictures of me playing with my kids, pictures of me in my bathroom, sleeping, bending over the hood of my car. He was watching me the entire time. I couldn't and didn't sleep for weeks. He ended up getting out of jail the following weekend and came into my mom's post office. She is a mail lady. To tell her that he found my dog dead and he buried it for me. And even after that, only received five years probation and a restraining order. He still lives across the street. I stayed for maybe three months and moved on to Fort Walton Beach. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true stalker stories. Before I go on, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spike, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Colt Stonewolf, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's Niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank each and every one of you for continuing to support Back to Ashes, for without you, there is no me or channel. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and be safe. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.